Do we have too much government? We need to put uh, people in ahead of corporate profits. This system is so lopsided. This threat is a real threat to democracy. And I think that's really important. That's something we haven't been doing in this country for a long time. Where do you start? What do you do? How do you do it? Access to Democracy and other Egan Community Television programming is supported by Thomson Reuters, makers of Westlaw Next and based in Egan. Through Westlaw Next and other innovative online services, Thomson Reuters is the world's leading source of intelligent information for businesses and professionals. Online at ThomsonReuters.com and by U.S. Federal Credit Union the member-owned financial institution offering service, value, and experience you can trust to the greater Twin Cities community. Access to Democracy returns. We have a return guest who has some interesting stories to tell us. He's been with us before. Mordecai Spector, the editor and publisher of American Jewish World. And I have a question for you right off the bat. How do you maintain your subscriber base? And I know you do, uh, with a weekly paper at a time when newspapers are having really a tough time and struggling. What's the trick that you've used? We have a dedicated mm -hmm. group of subscribers. Uh, the, the papers for the Jewish community in Minnesota which is and not that large. No, maybe 40, 45,000 Jews, mainly in the Twin Cities. But a lot of our subscribers have been getting the newspaper for 20, 30, 40, 50 years. So it's kind of part of the, uh, the lifestyle for people who are involved uh, in the Jewish community. So it, it is a problem. Um, uh, kids don't read newspapers. And there's a declining affiliation with the Jewish community and with organized religion generally. And then for the last five years, we're dealing with a bad economy. So the subscription numbers have gone down a bit. And um, it's an, an generally an older group, uh, baby boomers on up, who, who read the newspaper. But um, we offer a free three-month subscription to anyone who would like to try the uh, the newspaper. And the credits will be up there, so anybody who's interested. Right. <coughs> and um, we did uh, adapt to changing times uh, about four years ago. We went from weekly to bi-weekly publication. So the print edition comes out every other week, every other Friday. And we're also on the web. We put some of our content, some stories go up on our website, which is at AJW News dot com and uh, we're also on Facebook you can like the American Jewish world on Facebook and every day we put uh, new we post new moving items in, into the new world of uh, communication yeah. yeah I asked my students in one of my classes <coughs> a class of about uh, 25 how many of you read a newspaper every day one hand went up right one. I mean I read three and obviously I read uh, AJW when it comes out every other week. And so it's important. It's also important because you cover news of the Jewish community across the spectrum. You're not really pointed toward uh, any of the schisms that are in the Jewish community, uh, ultra-Orthodox, Orthodox, conservative, reform, uh, humanist, etc. So uh, you cover them all. Right. Uh, yeah, we're we're open to all uh, all comers, all different religious streams, secular, religious, and we try to cover a, a range of local events, Jewish events, um, cultural events, political things, and and then news from around the United States and around the world, and Israel, of course, Israel in the Middle East. You've also been involved in uh, some civic and charitable ventures as well, right? Yeah, we try to help out and be a media sponsor of different events, help help our communal organizations. We're all in this together. Well, for those people who are going to be looking at the New Year's edition, and the Jewish New Year comes early this year, 
look for an ad for my name was Toby. <laughs> I forgot to bring the I'm, I'm the worst marketer in the world. I forgot to bring a copy of the book here today. Okay. But we will do something. We'll look forward to Now, you just returned that. from uh, a really interesting trip to Israel. Not your first time there, but just from what you wrote about it, obviously it was a very significant trip to, for you. Yeah, I had a great time. It's just uh, Israel is a fabulous uh, place, and if you haven't been, you should go, and it's... Um, if you're religious or not, it's just, uh, there's just so much to say. Or if you're any religion, you should go. Because yeah. they all came from this one spot. Yeah, Muslim, Christian, Jewish, it's, um, there are attractions for <coughs> all the, the major religions. I mean, I will never get an award for being religious, but the history and the traditions are really important to me and the fact that I also uh, lived through the Holocaust, although I was in this country, uh, but uh, we lost all our relatives who I never met in Europe. And uh, of course, my grandfather came, my grandfather and grandmother came from Russia. I have visited all those places since, but I've also visited uh, Israel three times, once during a war, and uh, it's a very meaningful a uh, very meaningful trip. The last time that Sharon and I were there, we actually saw a bunch of people from Texas being baptized in the same river where Jesus was baptized. So, uh, I mean, it, it, you know, just incredible things that you can touch. Right. The, the, the first time I went to Israel in 1996, I was with a group of journalists, and there were Jewish and Christian journalists. So they took us around the country quickly and we saw a lot of things and we saw both Christian uh, holy sites and some of the, the Jewish attractions and but um, this this last time in, in June was my seventh visit to Israel and um, it was just it was just great it was um, the food is really good and uh, there's a market in Jerusalem called the Mahane Yehuda market it's a big Kind of farmers market, open yeah, air market, yeah, open air market, and it's, right? Um, there are a lot of restaurants and cafes <coughs> there, and it's become become a, a nightlife attraction in Jerusalem. The restaurants are open late, and really a lot of fun. And contrary to what people think, Israel is a very safe place to be. It's probably the safest place in the Middle East at the present time. Right. It's um, there haven't been any terrorist attacks in seven or eight years now. So I, I noticed I hadn't been in Israel in five years. My last, my previous trip was in 2008 and the security situation is noticeably relaxed. Less, um, less searches when you go into stores and restaurants, that kind of thing. And um, in Jerusalem, you're aware that there, there's a unresolved political problem you still see a lot of uh, young people, soldiers, security people with either sidearms or M16 or M4 rifles slung over their shoulders. So you're aware there's, there's some problems. When I was there during Desert Storm, everybody was armed. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course we had, had the scud attacks at the time. Uh, American soldiers were setting up Patriot missile bases, although they were not, uh, they would not acknowledge that they were American soldiers wearing t-shirts that says I IDF, Israel Defense Force and all. And I talked to some of them uh, on the plane going over. And you know, when you get somebody who answers you with a southern drawl, it's not from the south of Israel. Right. It's more like Tennessee, and uh, it was a very interesting experience. But talking about your trip to Israel, we're going to bring up some photos that you took now, and you took a lot of them, and you can tell us uh, really uh, what each of them represents. So I know the first one is, is of a market, and uh, there we go. That's a, that? a restaurant. The, the sign says Azura, and... Um, I don't know how you would care. It's kind of Middle Eastern food. I had a wonderful lunch. It was like 
spiced meatballs with eggplant and onions and potatoes, kind of a stew, and then pita bread and uh, pickles and uh, pickled peppers. And I, there, there was always more food than I was able to eat. So I have to bring my wife on a, a trip to Israel so she can help me uh, finish the food they well, put in Well, their front. agriculture has made great strides. <laughs> and uh, among other things. And uh, here we have another picture. And this looks like light rail. This is a, a new feature, and this worked out really well. This is the um, light rail train in Jerusalem. And this, I don't know, it started a couple years ago. And they have one line, kind of like the light rail in Minneapolis now. It, it runs from north to south, or starts in what they call East Jerusalem. The, the area of the city that was held by Jordan until the 1967 war, and then go south through the center of uh, West Jerusalem. And the terminus uh, in the south is Mount Herzl, the National Cemetery. And so w one of my first days in Jerusalem, I rode it to Mount Herzl. I'd never seen the cemetery. So I saw the, the plaza and the grave of Theodore Herzl, the founder of Zionism. Right. And, uh, <coughs> Uh, walk through the cemetery. They have uh, sections for the um, the war dead from each of the the Israeli wars, and then um, there's a, a area called the National Leader Section where prime ministers and dignitaries are buried. Uh, Yitzhak Rabin and Golda Meir and other prime ministers. The first time I was in Israel, and this I guess was '85, uh, I was awed by the fact that I saw. Uh, King David's tomb and Christ's tomb on the same day. Mm -hmm. And uh, that, that's pretty, uh, uh, that, that's a breathtaking experience. And then going to the top of Masada where a few people held out against the uh, legions of Rome for years mm -hmm. was another great experience. How about the Dead Sea? How about the Dead Sea? <laughs> Dead Sea is great fun. Yes, it is. <laughs> Even if you can't swim, you just float. You float. You can read a book or a magazine. Or Although it is shrinking. Yeah. But yeah, the Dead Sea is shrinking. I didn't uh, make it to, to the Dead Sea. I, I was in Jerusalem and Haifa briefly, which is the, the northern port city, and then at the end in Tel Aviv for a couple nights. And being in Tel Aviv, is like being in any metropolitan city, any place. Really. It's um, kind of a 24-7 place. It's uh, always going. There's this Mediterranean uh, vibe. People are on the streets all mm -hmm. the time and just a lot of fun. I was there for something they call Lila Levan, the White Night Festival. It's an annual festival and so every uh, every young person in Tel Aviv from say 15 to 30 was in the street for Thursday night all night long. There were bands, lots of stuff going on. I made it till about 2 in the morning. I think the most dangerous thing in Israel at the present time are the drivers. Yeah. Uh, they are, you know, they talk about Tokyo and they talk about Rome, but the Israelis are right up there with them. Uh, they drive as though their life depends on it, and maybe it does a lot of the time. <clears throat> I was taking taxi cabs all the time. There were, there were a couple, uh, just a couple frightening rides uh, where the driver was really going too fast and weaving in and out of traffic. And Generally, with that, that was kind of an, an adventure. You didn't know what, what would happen a lot of times with the taxi cabs. Now, back to the uh, light rail. You said that Really, it's an amalgam of everybody. Anybody just gets on it. Okay. Yeah, it's um, the religious and secular Israelis. Jerusalem, I noticed, is a little more religious, what they refer to as the ultra-Orthodox, the Hasidic Jews, or what, what they say in, he in Hebrew, they're called Haredim, the fervently Orthodox Jews. And then very you know, secular Israelis. And then there are Arabs, too, in the north that goes through Arab neighborhoods. And uh, so there's kind of uh, they can all, uneasy... They all just get on the train. Yeah, generally. Uh, I think there's...
people are a little suspicious of one another, but they coexist and mix on the trains. And do those trains run on Saturday? No. Not in Jerusalem? No. Not on uh, uh. Friday night it stops at a certain time and then resumes Saturday evening. Mm -hmm. Respecting the Sabbath. Right. Right. Uh, we've got some other pictures, so let's uh, bring up, that looks like it's the island of Bali, except that uh, it's written in Hebrew, the sign. What is That's, that? That's uh, near Haifa. That's in the north. And it's a Ethiopian house. It's at a place called Yabin Ord Youth Village. And this is a uh, community, like a residential school, for about 400 teenagers, uh, orphans, immigrants, primarily from Ethiopia, Ethiopian uh, Jews, and um, at-risk youth. So um, they, the, most of the students are of Ethiopian ancestry. There are 130,000 Ethiopians living in Israel. And um, that the Ethiopian house is to remind the, um, the Ethiopians of their proud heritage. And also it's a memorial to the 4,000 Ethiopian Jews who died in the trek across the desert in Sudan trying to get to Israel in the 80s and 90s. Okay, let's see what else we've got. Uh, Mordecai brought us so many photos. We can't use them all, but... Uh, this is uh, a shot from my balcony at the Dan Carmel Hotel, which is atop Haifa on Mount Carmel. So you're looking down on uh, part of the city of Haifa and Haifa Bay. You can see the ships out in the distance. You and can't quite see where the, the sea The Mediterranean ends, Sea. The Mediterranean. It looks like the ships are in the distance are kind of floating somewhere out there. And in the foreground to the right center is the Baha'i Temple. And it's a um, uh, famous uh, tourist attraction. You can't see the uh, the gardens, which is that go the, up to gold, the, uh, the gold roof that we yeah, see there. Yeah, the gold dome. That's the Baha'i Temple, okay. and they have gardens that slope down to the street and uh, what they call the German colony, the Templars who settled uh, hundred years ago, more than hundred years ago in Israel. Interesting thing about Haifa. Uh, is that number one, it's a very busy port city. Uh, number two, it's uh, one of the few places where the buses do run on the Sabbath. Oh, I didn't take any buses there. It's, uh, it's a mixed city. There's, I think, 10% of the population is Arab. And uh, I, was, I was just there this time for one night. I've been there a few times. And let's bring up the next photo and see what we've got. And Looks this like is watermelons the, uh, to me. This is the, the market, the Mahane Yehuda market. I think it's got watermelons and what else? Looks like um, zucchini or something. And that's what it looks it. like, an eggplant uh, in the distance there. This is a, a big farmer's market, and the restaurant we saw earlier was, was in the same marketplace. And this is in uh, West Jerusalem. There is a sign that says something sells for two. Two shekels for something or other, I don't know. It's a My Hebrew isn't too good. I wasn't a good uh, Hebrew school No, student. nor was I. <coughs> I used to skip Hebrew school to go play ball, mm -hmm. but uh, I wasn't good at that either. I, in Hebrew, I can ask where the bathrooms are and um, can I have the check, please? Those are the... I've got that down Couple in Spanish, good, but not in phrases. Hebrew. <laughs> La cuenta, si vous play. Uh, okay, let's see what we have next. This is at a uh, light rail train stop. Um, the guy on the left, I guess he's maybe for with a private security firm. He's not wearing a military uniform. There's a soldier next to him who, I don't think he has a rifle, but... And I, I don't know what kind of uh, rifle exactly that is. Usually you see all the soldiers with their weapons. They come home for the weekends and things like that, and they're always carrying their weapons. Yeah, sometimes. <coughs> it's kind of a mixed thing. Sometimes okay. they have it, sometimes not. 
And if Josh would be good enough, there we go. This is the uh, beach in Tel Aviv. And this is great fun. The waves are, what, six, eight feet high, and you kind of jump in the waves, and they pick you up and knock you back and want to try and stay on your feet. And it's just, uh, just beautiful. Tel Aviv has a marvelous beach. It goes for miles, and uh, from Yaffa, I don't know how, how far it goes, but uh, certainly on the weekends in particular, you'll find it just full of Israelis. Right. I have a little story about the beach. I was, I was playing in the waves, and uh, then I noticed a man, maybe an Israeli man about my age, and he was looking for something and gesturing. He lost his glasses. The wave had knocked his glasses off. So the, you can go out like 100 yards, and the water is still shallow, but the, the waves are coming in and out. And so it's, it's a big sea, big ocean there, and uh, where are you going to find the glasses? But a minute or two later, I was, wa I was wading in the water, and I felt something with my foot. And I reached down, and I pulled out a pair of glasses. And I saw the guy who was walking out of the water, and I yelled yeah. to him and gave him his glasses. He was, he was very happy. That, that was, was a happy them. man. <laughs> <laughs> okay, what else do we have in the way of pictures? I, here we go. These are two of my new friends. Um, on the left is um, Ami, Ami Kaufman, and on the right is Dahlia Shenlin, and they're writers for 972 magazine. It's an online magazine in English. It gives you a left-wing perspective on um, political uh, issues in Israel. 972? Yeah. It's, Are uh, they online? Yeah, 972mag.com. And 972 is the uh, area code, the international area code for Israel. So uh, I arranged to meet them uh, and uh, spent a, a couple hours talking with them. I, I met a number of political figures in Israel so I could uh, talk about what I'd been hearing and they gave me their perspective on a number of topics relating, relating to the peace process. Are they hopeful about the peace process? Uh, they're, they're, they're critical of uh, government policies generally and um, you can, you can look at, th there, there are a variety of writers. There's a whole cast of writers for 972 Magazine. And um, there, there are a lot of different viewpoints. The, 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 the website generally is against the occupation, against the Israeli occupation of the Palestinian territories, what, what we call the West Bank, mm -hmm. and um, for well, democracy. Very good. We have their website address right up there. Right. <coughs> now, uh, do we have any other photos there? That's it? I was hoping you would have the picture of me and Dr. Ruth. When I was talking, at the end of the evening, talking with uh, Ami and Dahlia, yeah. they noticed a woman sitting at the next booth. This was in, at the Dan Tel Aviv Hotel, and they said, there's a celebrity over there. And I saw this elderly woman, and I wasn't quite sure who she was, but they told me it was Dr. Ruth, Dr. Ruth Westheimer, yes. the famous sex <clears throat> therapist and media personality. Didn't and she just pass away uh, no, the last month? No, she didn't. She's quite, she's tiny, she's yes. about that tall, and she's 85 years old, and she said um, that she comes to Israel about, Israel about once a year to go on TV. And she lived in Israel um, after, after the war. She's uh, a Holocaust survivor from Germany, born in Germany. And um, we had, we had a, a little chat, and um, Ami and Dahlia met her. And I, I introduced myself and told her I was a big fan. And at, at some point she said uh, in Israel, she, we, she learned that we were talking about politics, and she said, in Israel, I never talk about politics, only sex. 
<laughs> She's 85. So that, that was, you, you never you never know what's going to happen. Now you've had a couple of interesting editorials uh, since you're back. <clears throat> One was called Starve the Children, and it was directed at Congressman Klein, who used to be a regular on this show uh, until I questioned why he didn't debate his opponent one year, and he hasn't been back since. Uh, <clears throat> but we used to have some really heated and interesting debates. But uh, what were you saying in Starve the Children? Well, this is the debate over uh, food stamps, or what they call SNAP now, the SNAP program, Supplemental Nutrition Program. And it seems like for years now, um, John Klein has been trying to um, uh, X out funding for, for food stamps. And it's part of this um, uh, effort in Congress to um, you know, cut social spending for those who are, are most in need and we cut social spending for those who need it right uh, and make life better for those who don't so I, I was um, I become uh, I've become aware in recent years about um, food insecurity the fact that 50 million Americans um, don't know where their their next meal is coming from or where how they're going to eat tomorrow uh, including a lot of children. So I think generally most Americans would, would like to have uh, children get adequate nutrition. And I think there's a political problem as far as spending for uh, uh, food stamps. I think it's priorities that are skewed. We're buying uh, military hardware, which the military doesn't want, but Congress insists on because uh, in many cases, the congressmen have the manufacturing plants in their district, so they're making things like tanks, and the military says, we have enough tanks. We have, I think, 4,000 tanks. We don't need more, and yet they keep budgeting uh, for these things. It's, it really uh, is, a, is just a skewed way of thinking. And you had another uh, article, Israelis Embrace Obama. Right, uh, yeah, Obama was in Israel in March, and uh, the, the last time I was in Israel was 2008, and I got there uh, two days after the uh, national elections, after Obama was elected president. Mm -hmm. And I recall writing an editorial then about how everyone in America was excited about the election of Barack Obama and hope and change. And the Israelis were here. very skeptical. The Israelis didn't know who he was, and... Uh, uh, they were concerned that the Americans had elected, the Jewish Israelis yeah. uh, were worried that they we'd elected a president. And it's interesting a now, name. because, uh, and we're just about out of time, that the Israelis uh, are very accepting of them now, and we're becoming skeptical. Right. And we've been talking to Mordecai Spector, American Jewish World. We have run out of time. Interesting interview. Come back soon, and thanks so much. Thanks, Alan. Thanks.